welcome to Kiwi Living. Coming up, Monty Beetham is in Lake Tekapo checking out its gorgeous holiday offerings. The humble chook has had a resurgence in backyard popularity, so our resident vet, Dr. Stacey, is here with everything you need to know about having chickens at your place. Tony visits a garden that looks utterly stunning, 365 days a year. Ever fancied entertaining with a Chinese banquet at your place? Or Mike consults an expert to show you how. The DIY team are back with a super affordable and super easy outdoor set that'll have you heading for the electric tools. And Monty has a lowdown on surviving the flu season. That's tonight on Kiwi Living. No my hara mai, it's Friday and we've got some excellent ideas for your weekend. Tonight marks the beginning of the school holidays, so we sent Monty to the beautiful Mackenzie country, Lake Tekapo to be exact. We wanted to know if it really is a fabulous place to consider for a family holiday. So Monty's hitting the road to find out what Tekapo has to offer. We all take in turns this series to explore holiday options for you that are close to home. I'm heading to the beautiful South Island to a place I've never been before, Lake Tekapo. A lot of us probably head to the Southern Alps for skiing, and I love an active holiday. But there's always someone else in the family who likes a little bit more R&R. &R. So I'm going to suss out if Tikapo is a place that can keep the whole family happy. Plus, I've heard there's amazing nightlife. I like a bit of adventure, so I'm quick to ditch the car for a mountain bike. Tikapo is set in the heart of Mackenzie country, pretty much halfway between Queenstown and Christchurch. The village has a permanent population of only 350. It's set in an amazing alpine landscape bordered by mountain ranges next to its famous glacial blue lake. Jumping on a bike is a great way to take in your surroundings and Tekapo is a launching pad for one of New Zealand's most awesome bike routes which starts from the Alps and goes all the way to the sea. Jason Menard works for Alps to Ocean. Hello. Hey. It's an epic ride which shows off New Zealand in all its glory. Today we're riding the section from Tekapo to Lake Pukaki. What is that? That's oh, amazing, mate. Jason, what makes this ride so special? Kind of like a mini snapshot of the whole country. That's what I like about it. You just get to see such an incredible scenery. It really is. There's never a dull moment on the A20. Woo -hoo -hoo -hoo! Look at that. That's invigorating. <laughs> That's brave. That's very cold water. <laughs> it sure is. <laughs> The official starts at Al Rocky Mount Cook, but that involves a helicopter ride. So we're seeing more and more people opting to begin their journey in Tekapo and sort of link into it via the canal road. How far is the actual ocean from here? Only a mere 283 kilometers. <laughs> Why are you smiling for? <laughs> that scares me. You'd be fine. You could knock it off in two or three days. Most normal people, four to six days. You know, you, it's not a race. You want to slow down, take in the sights, it's a leisurely journey. I actually did this with my family, uh, my wife and I, when we had our two-year-old son and a nine-month-old daughter, hitched a trailer to this bike right here and pulled them for most of the trail. How did you keep yourself sane through a trip like that with your kids? The minute the bike was moving, they would fall asleep. So if we had to stop somewhere, one person would be <laughs> just moving the bike in circles with the trailer on it because you never wake a sleeping infant. Look at that mountain, eh? Well, you don't get that. Start like around Auckland, my friend. <laughs> Well, thanks, Joe. You go ahead, mate. I'll catch you later. All right. Cheers, Monty. Well, it really doesn't matter whether you've got young legs or aging legs. If you want to do a little or a lot, this is a beautiful part of New Zealand and a great day's adventure for the family. OK, so I realise some people like to take things a little bit easier on holiday, my wife included. She loves a bit of R&R, &R, and I reckon I could have that sussed. Tekapur Hot Pools. The three hot pools are surrounded in native alpine plants and they've been shaped like three of the local lakes. I think when we start with Tekapo, it's very cold out here and I'm told it's 38 degrees. That's a lot warmer than the real thing. And there's also an awesome kids aqua area. And a super big kids too! This really is a great place to bring the family. Think about this in winter. It's cold out there, but in the pool, it's beautiful. It's lovely, 38 degrees. A good place to unwind and relax the body. At 25 bucks for an adult, it may seem a bit pricey, but the good thing is, it's valid all day, so you can come back as many times as you like. As much as I like to hang around, the sun is going down and there's nightlife to check out. Something very special can be seen in Tekapo after dark, and I've come up to the Mount John Observatory to see it for myself. In New Zealand, we have reserves that look after all of our natural wonders, but I've never heard of one that protects the night sky against light pollution. 
Almost half a million hectares in this area are an official dark sky reserve, the biggest in the world. There's no white light and no lights on buildings, streets or even in your garden are allowed to point upwards. And according to Dallas, one of the guides up here, in Tikkapur, they have some of the clearest night skies on the planet. Wow. That is a beast. It is, isn't it? Wow. This is known as the MOA telescope. Uh, and it's part of a worldwide network of telescopes that is uh, basically hunting for planets. So it's a planet hunter. It's a planet hunter. It's a planet hunter. Doesn't that sound very, cool? Very successful one too. All right, Dallas, when does all the action start up here? Uh, basically, as soon as it gets dark. Um, this guy's standing ready 24-7. Uh, so as soon as the stars come out, she's up and running. Now, I don't really know my Mars from my Venus, but I've got to say, I do love trying new things. And I've heard that the night tours up here are unforgettable. And it's red light only. Apparently 50% of the world's population can no longer see the night sky because of light pollution. I think we should thank our lucky stars that we can because it's something special. It has really surprised me. Whether you want some action or you want to dial it right back and relax, I've got to say, it really does have something for everyone. It is absolutely beautiful. For more information on having a holiday here, check out our website. Absolutely gorgeous, isn't it? Now, if you like a cycling holiday, we took the kids on the Otago Rail Trail over Christmas. Couldn't recommend it more. Easy and suited to all budgets. Now, quintessential Kiwi living in our next story, we're looking at chickens as pets. The humble chook is fast becoming a common urban occurrence, so if you've ever thought about overflowing baskets of eggs at your place, then this story is for you. Here's Dr Stacey Tremaine. Chickens. They've always been good out on the farm, but we're moving into the city. So your basic suburban chicken is becoming the new black for 2016. What do you reckon, little one? Should we go and get some to eat? If you're thinking about getting some chickens, there are a few things you need to know. So I thought I'd come up here and see Sean Bishop. Come on, girls! She's the founder of the Animal Sanctuary in Matakana and has recently rescued 1,500 battery hens. Good girls! Come on! As someone who's potentially interested in actually taking on some rescued chickens, mm -hmm. What would I need to know to get set up before I actually take the chickens on? Good question. The first thing you need to do is check with your council and find out what the regulations are because different councils do have different regulations. So I'm, I'm looking at your beautiful coops here. Do I need to buy one or can I make one? Is there any advice? Well, coops here? come in a wide range from handmade ones through to really high-end, trendy, you know, chicken Taj Mahals. But basically what they all have to provide is the same thing. There has to be an indoor area where the chickens can go inside on a cold, wet winter's night and be warm and dry and weatherproof. Yes. And then an outdoor area that is contained called a run so they can get some sun and peck at some grass and those kind of things. Then you probably want to have a little bit of room for them to come out and free range as well and then go back into the coop at night to sleep. And, and when they're free ranging, are they going to come and dig my garden up or are they... They well? are. Yeah. They are. They're actually little tractors so when you're ready to turn your garden over it's great to put the chickens in because yeah, they good, will good. scratch everything up. But if you want beautiful, you know, gardens then you do need to put some chicken wire up to keep the chickens on one side and your plants on the other. The next thing to consider is finding your chicken. So if I was looking to get a rehabilitated chicken, mm -hmm. where would I go? Well, um, there are rescue groups in various parts of the country who rescue brown shavers um, at, when they're 18 months old. We then rehab them, adopt them out, and um, we get phenomenal feedback from people about how much they love their hens. And I think that's the thing, that they, they have got so much personality and they have got so much attitude that it's, it's a little bit of a nice surprise that you get an egg as well. They're also much more intelligent than we realise. And part of the things that, that people love about dogs is the training aspect of things. That's true. And the bonding that you mm -hmm, get through that. Mm -hmm. is, is that something we could achieve? With Absolutely. These can actually teach them all kinds of tricks, but the more important thing is that they do bond. I mean, they will yeah. come. When you were holding that chicken earlier today, she was snuggling right down into oh, you. That was fantastic. And, um, yeah. yeah, they actually enjoy giving and receiving affection, just like a dog or a cat. I guess one of the cool things about chickens is it's not going to cost much to feed them. No, it's not. It's not very expensive at all. I mean, you do need chicken pellets, and that's what these girls are having right now. Come on, girls. Tick, 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 tick. What we like to do is feed mash in the morning pellets at night. It's a great way to get some oyster grit into them, so they need to replenish their calcium. Yes. And they also need something in their crops to help grind up the food. So now that we've got the digestion side of things sorted, 
one surefire way to lose all the benefits of that is to allow our chickens to get worms. Absolutely. Worms are one of the health hazards. People know to worm their cats and dogs, and they don't think to worm their hens. To get a proper wormer, you do need to see your vet. People are a little bit nervous about this, but it's actually much easier than it looks. So you just bring the hen up. <laughs> all right, little one. Can we just have a little look there? We're just gently going to go over that trachea, down the back. That's it, she's warm. So we can see it's nice and easy. It's yep. not that scary to she's do. not stressed at all. And of course the other great thing is that we can actually use it for mites. Yes, you can use it topically. Yeah, where we usually put it is a couple of drops just here at the base of the neck. Yep. And then we usually put another two down the base of the tail. Perfect. Is it anywhere else you guys put them? Some people put a couple of drops under the wing. Yeah, but it, it, it's just a bit harder As long to put as you're there. getting onto the skin and not the feathers. So you just part the feathers, get onto the skin, Absolutely. and then that will take care of mites. But what about the behavioural side of things? Is there anything that we can do to sort of enrich our chickens' lives? Yeah, you can introduce new foods. Like if you put down a piece of watermelon that they've never seen before yeah. and then they discover what it is and pretty soon they'll hollow it out or half a coconut, they just go crazy. But another thing you can do is if you have a log and you leave it there for a few days and then every once in a while you roll it a half turn, underneath there's always spiders and slugs and Absolutely. they will quickly learn that it's like the candy shop. And as soon as you go near the log, they'll come running to see what, what they're going to discover. Just simple tricks like that that give them some stimulation and some interest. So chickens in the city. It's pretty easy, really. Good strong coop. Need a nice run, good indoor area. Bit of chicken wire around the outside gives you a little bit more extra space. Make sure you worm regularly. And the last thing, make sure you've got a good chicken feed. It's not going to cost you much. Feed some table scraps if you need to, but just remember, what goes in does come back out. So if you've just fed beetroot, don't be too worried. All right, girls, no beetroot here. Coming up, Tony visits a special garden that holds its own no matter the weather. Mike is cooking authentic Chinese dishes perfect for weekend entertaining. And the makeover team show you how to revive your tired, faded outdoor furniture and create a whole new set for under $150. Hello, my friend. Lovely to see you. Good evening. So I have to tell you, recently I dug out our garden bed. I don't really know what to do next, though, because I don't know if the soil quality is good enough to plant, and I don't actually even really know what to plant. I am pleased that you've just been out in the garden. What, what you do? can do in future is just cut the crop off and leave it on the top, and that'll oh. mulch down into the ground. Or you can try putting in a green crop. Now, green cropping is a way of re-energising the soil and protecting the soil, so when it comes to springtime, when you have your new greens, you'll have some good results. And for more information, just go to the website. You'll see lots of info there. Excellent. I'll do that. And maybe if I lift my game, I might get something approximating tonight's garden. I think you should first of all have a look around this garden and then you'll be inspired to become a real true Kiwi gardener. We have found an extraordinary garden that looks good 365 days of the year. It's affectionately known as Omayo, which means peace, tranquility and quiet. And we're about to go and check it out. When Liz Morrow purchased seven hectares of land on Takatu Peninsula, her dream was to create a garden with all of it. And that's just what she's done. Hello. Hi, Tony. How are you? Good. Oh, nice to see you. Nice to see you. Come on in. Oh, wow, this looks amazing. And we had the big storm last night. The rain was coming down there. Where's all the mess? I know, it blew a howling gale. Well, God's pretty resilient. I think it's the native planting that can stand up to it, Tony. It looks mm. amazing. What I do like is how you have very creatively massaged a garden into a natural native setting by the sea. That is incredible. Yes, well, thanks, Tony. We didn't start planting the garden until July 2006. Yeah. And because we've placed ourselves here in a beautiful native bush setting, I turn my attention to natives. You and love them. I do love them. Yeah. But mix that up with lots of um, exotics. It's like a nice tapestry, isn't it? It is. So just beyond her formal garden, Liz decided to use a canopy of existing trees to create a beautiful understory. Gosh, this area's changed a bit in the years that I came here. It was completely bare. This is amazing understory planting. Well, I've used Arthropodium here, Tony, planted about 500, between 500 and 600. Yeah. That's the Matapuri Bay, this, this green one. Mm. And then mix that up with Clivias, the yellow, which really glows underneath the canopy of the existing natives. And all of our really big works. tree ferns as well, they look great. They were here, so we just, um, you know, use those as the canopy. Well, now we're in the Kauri Cathedral, and the paths have got lovely rhythm and flow, haven't they? Well, my son John um, developed all these paths. Tony started that in 2007, 
so they flow beautifully through the stand of native trees. Gosh, this is just incredible. In this day where sections are all chopped up and lots of houses put onto them, you could have done that. You could have actually turned this into quite a nice subdivision. Never, Tony. <laughs> Never, no. Nice looking out over Kawao Bay with Kawao Island in the distance. Wow. And it's a wet seat too. <laughs> <laughs> it's all that rain. I like how you've used all the fallen pungalogs to form edges for your parts. These are Dicksonias, very prone to drought, so when they die, we cut them out, look at the certain shapes so that we get those lovely curves on the path edges. Who needs Pilates classes? Just come and work with Liz for the day in the garden. This is my Pilates <laughs> room, my gymnasium, my golf course. Yes, it keeps me busy. Isn't that view to die for? It's lovely and peaceful, isn't it? I'll take it. It's not yours to have, Tony. Rude. <laughs> <laughs> a variety of natural sculpture also features in the garden. Liz wanted it to blend in with the natural environment rather than compete with it. Well, these are a bit of fun, but interesting stepping stones. Where are we off to next? Got to keep looking to your left, Tony. There oh, it is. Oh, for goodness sakes, what do you like? <laughs> yeah, it's fabulous, isn't it? The Moro Mower. That's garden sculpture. It is, that's built to scale. So they were estimated to be about four metres in height, made of um, local driftwood off the beach and puri logs from the bush. Perfect spot into the bush. So you like a bit of sculpture in the garden? No, oh, just a little bit, Tony. Don't overdo it. I've probably only got three or four pieces yeah. on the whole property. That's enough. And determined to have a garden that looks good 365 days of the year, Liz is also partial to a little structure in the garden. Well, lots of spherical shapes and big curves in the garden here. It's, it all looks very measured out. Well, Tony, I wanted to create soft shaping rounds and curves, and that was to reflect the waves and the coastal shapes. You must have had the tape measure out over here, though, in getting these. How did you do that? A hose. I borrowed and laid out hundreds of metres of garden hose. And you can see the shape here, so I laid the hoses out on the lawn. Um, all around the cabin, wanting to create these lovely curves and waves and flowing effect. So it took six months to achieve. All by the eye. It, indeed. No measuring tapes? No. And these are Pittosporum golf ball. I've renamed it Pittosporum tennis ball. Tennis ball. So the idea is that they've escaped off the court onto the lawn. I like it. What's Liz's tip for pruning? Well, I don't know that if I have a specific tip, Tony, but these need doing about four times a year. Even the Koru-shaped vegetable garden appears to be a piece of natural sculpture, of a more functional kind. Although small, it provides year-round vegetables for Liz, as well as an orchard, which sits just behind, featuring guava, lemons, limes, apples, fijoas and oranges. In Liz's garden, she's got lots of shaded areas and dappled light, and you might have this at your place, and it means that you've actually got a perfect opportunity to put in some great planting. Already a some naturalised duty of fern, but she's gone and mixed in a little bit of exotic with her natives using clivias and beautiful virginias. It's a nice way of adding colour in early spring and right through till summer. And Liz has even created several outdoor rooms which sit seamlessly, as if they've always been here, and the lines between the house and the garden feel blurred. And here again, Liz has continued her circular theme with potted plants. I know you like having pots at home, but often you use little tiny pots and put them down to the ground and then they pile into insignificance. Do what Liz has done. Nice big pots, evergreen plants, shape them, and then you've got year-round interest. Little pots on the tabletops only. I've had a lovely day with you. I've enjoyed your company, thank you, Tony. The garden looks great. In fact, it looks good 365 days of the year, doesn't it? Yes, it does. I think that's because of the plant choice. Um, natives, lots of evergreens, um, hints of colour, but um, a soft palette. So the garden I designed so it was easy on the eye, not a lot of interruption. So a lot of shape and form and texture. And you do it yourself. I do. Um, work in the garden every day, but I do get help in from time to time when I need it. It's a real credit to you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Oh, they look so stunning, so gorgeous every single day of the year. I want to live there. <laughs> Me too. Just incredible. And the night before there was a big storm and there was no power and yet Liz got out there and made it look just perfect. Wow, she out there every day. A couple of hours every day. She says it's a low maintenance garden. Oh my God, I love that. I've got to lift my game. Mm. Thank you for that, Tony. Now, here's what's coming up. Looking to wow your friends, Mike has a tasty dinner party solution. From faded to fabulous, Dion and Melissa breathe new life into this autumnal deck. And Monty Beetham has the good oil on how best to avoid the flu. 
I love yum cha. It's a must-have family feast, but I'd never attempt one myself until now. Mike is about to share with us the ultimate Chinese meal for you to cook up this weekend, and it's authentic and so delish. I just love yum cha. It's a feast of flavours. And there's nothing better than coming out, sitting down with friends and family around a lazy Susan. I'm keen to replicate some of these flavours at home. And you'll be surprised, it's easier than what you think. Oh, oh yeah, thank you. Yay. So for your weekend yum cha experience at home, I've asked restaurateur, author and genius cook Connie Clarkson for three delectable recipes. Pork and prawn dumplings, braised catskin stuffed with fish, and finally, steamed beef balls. So Connie, we've got all these beautiful ingredients in front of us. What's on the menu? We're going to do shumai. 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 Very good. Which is steamed pork and prawn dumplings. So the first thing, uh, Mike, I'll get you to do is to just squeeze those shiitake mushrooms a little bit and chop that up into a fine dice. In the meantime, I'm going to put the chopped up prawns. So this is raw shrimp that um, I put through a food processor. And we'll add in the shredded carrot. And we'll put the spring onions in, salt. We have sesame seed oil and a teaspoon of corn flour just to, to, to bind it. Okay. And we're going to put an egg in there too. So we've cracked the egg. The egg and the corn flour comes together and then that, and that, that binds, binds it. it. Okay. Correct, correct. We've got a sous chef, look at him. <laughs> right, right. Uh, is that fine good. enough, chef? Is that fine enough? Oh, I'll keep going, mate. Okay, no problem. Pop it and? in. So the next thing is to mix. Okay. So am I going to get you my hands dirty? I can do that. You get your hands dirty. Here we go. So just mix go. this all up. Mix it until it's really well mixed okay. through. The smell is amazing. You know what? It's that sesame seed oil. Okay. We're going to put them in a bamboo steamer. Yep. And we line the, the steamer with some greaseproof paper that's got holes cut in them to stop them from sticking, but letting the steam through. Cool. Right. So firstly, a thin wonton wrapper, painting it with some water just so that everything can hold together. Okay. Gives it a little bit of stickability. Yes. Okay. And a small golf ball size spoonful of meat in the middle. Okay. And you want to just gather up the sides together and put them on the bench and just form it into a little poof. An AP. Singular. Singular uh, one P uh, in the middle. Don't get too extravagant. Only one well, P. Only one P, not two. One P. One P in. And pop to your uncle. Dish two. What are we doing? Braised fish stuffed capsicums. We've got the little beautiful peppers over there, Mike. Do you want to, about, we need about a dozen of those. A dozen of these? Yes, and we need some fish. Now, the fish we have put through the food processor so that it's nice and fine. Salt, pepper, corn flour, a bit of sugar, and water. And while I am doing this, would you mind, please, I'll show you one, no, and then no. you can do the rest. Okay. So we want to actually take away the pips and clean it out, and that's it. My grandparents would actually do the two cleaver chop with the fish. So be to, to make it, yeah, you know, like this, until it gets really, really nice and fine. But the other thing that they do, and I'm going to show it to you, they slap the fish. This it's, fish? Like this, like this, look. You take it on. Wow. And what does that do? It makes it a bit boingy. Boingy. Bouncy. So at some stage, that's going to bounce back at you. Hopefully not today, Mike. <laughs> Hopefully not today. So how's that, Connie? Yeah. Here's an important step. We, we're going to fill it with the fish force mate. Yep. But we want it to be able to stick in there. So just a tad of corn flour dusting to make sure we get it in. Ah. So the corn flour kind of acts like a glue and yeah, keeps it in there. that's right. Well, that's tricky, so Connie. Do not fall out. How about that? Now, spoon for you. Spoon for me. So, we fill like this. Want to get it right in and then mould it nicely, like so. So, let's cook them. So, we want to put the capsicums fish side down. We just want to make sure that it's nicely seared off but not burnt. Oh, look at that. See? Just very quickly. The smell coming off that is amazing. It looks fantastic. And that's about all the browning that we're going to need. Finishing off the dish. Okay. 
You Should might. I get in there? Sous chef. I, I feel like I'm not dirty. Like, no. Okay. okay, so put in some black bean garlic paste. Oh, oh, oh. now this now this smell good. is really mm. great. Ah, amazing. There's some chicken stock going in. And we're going to pop these back in there now. Fish side up. Okay. This is wonderful. Mm. So the lid's on there, so it's not going to reduce down. It's going to steam yeah. themselves and in that braising liquor until they're cooked. Mm. Oh, delicious! And for our third dish, ngao yuk yin. Who? <laughs> Beef balls. Beef balls. Ngao yuk yin. Ngao yuk yin. Yeah, not bad, not okay. bad, not bad. So the ingredients for the... Meatballs. <laughs> ngao yuk yin are <laughs> spring onions, Orange rind, coriander, corn flour and sugar, black pepper, salt, soy sauce, sesame seed oil, and an egg white to bind. Fantastic. And you know what's the simplest one of all the whole lot? We put it all in there. Sous chef's going to mixy 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 mixy, and then we're going to roll it up and steam. And that's Fantastic. It. Ready? Go, chef. Me in there. Go. Yes. Perfect. And you know what's going to happen after you've done all that? Yes. You're going to do a beef slap. Are we beef slapping it? <laughs> yeah. We're getting ready for a beef slap. Are you ready? <laughs> Not bad. Not bad. Wow, this is amazing. I love this. I've never slapped my beef. OK. Goody? Yeah. Yep, goody. Winning the hands. Golf size. Ball, like this. Roll. OK, it was wash ready. All that's left to do is to serve our delicious yum cha dishes and eat them. A little bit of steam. Connie, this is the perfect meal for friends and family this weekend, isn't it? Yeah. Why don't you give it a go? All the recipes are on the website. Let's dig in, people! Yeah. Coming up, it's makeover time. You'll love this deck transformation. It's super simple and super affordable. And the flu, it's hideous and it's on its way. Monty in the dock with some must-know tips on how to avoid the flu this year. Time for another makeover, always a favourite of mine, this time in your outdoor living space. And while it might be getting colder, there's still time to get outside before the really rough weather hits. So Melissa and Dion are on the job to freshen up your UV faded outdoor space for autumn. And tonight's project is high quality, low budget. Autumn is here and winter's not far away. So what do we do with our tired outdoor spaces? Well, this is a great summer deck, but now that it's autumn, I want to change it into a more of a sort of stylized, cosy place and make it somewhere you actually want to hang out in the cooler months. So a nice, cosy outdoor autumn space. Exactly. So I want to bring in cushions and rugs and a new table, yeah. maybe a nice new bench seat to sit with that table. Hey, i got a great idea for a cost-effective table and bench seat that uh, anyone can knock out this weekend. And that trellis has got to go. It's got to go. So I'll help you get started. Let's clear the deck. What are we going to do with this? This is fixed. Yeah, that's cool. We're going to leave it and I'm going to just incorporate it and stain it and put a beautiful squab on it. Just leave it there? Yeah. Give it a yank. Oh. Ready? Yeah. Oh, I love doing this, eh? This is the best part of building. Uh, it's just ripping things to bits. You're mowing. Especially when I've got a lovely assistant like you who <laughs> I just pass it to. Save yourself the grief and buy a pre-framed nice. piece of trellis. It doesn't cost a huge amount and it's just a matter of painting it and whacking it in. Shuffle it down a little bit more? Yep, just a little bit more because we're creating this privacy as well as yep. keeping the wind and everything out, like an outdoor room. This is the base of it all. Exactly. We can have big parties out here, nice and private. <laughs> in no time at all, the horizontal slats of the new trellis modernises the space and lifts the feel instantly. A coat of paint or stain can work wonders for tired old furniture and it's great on the budget. But before we do that, we need to prep the wood. So we're going to use this Cabot Deck Clean. Just get a stiff brush and give it a good scrub. Let it dry thoroughly and then we're ready to apply the stain. So it's quite important to um, apply it quite thickly, eh? like get right into all the little cracks. It absorbs really fast. How many coats do you think you should do? Probably just do two. And then you might have to probably repeat it every couple of years. I think this is a lot more effective than even buying a new piece of furniture and way cheaper. I've had this squall and these cushions made with this beautiful outdoor fabric range from James Dunlop from Guthrie Baron. And they don't look like outdoor fabric, but they are really practical for outdoor use. They're really beautiful. 
This is essential to warm up the area and make it nice and cosy so you don't have any cold bums on seat. I like it. I think you've done well. Yeah, I love these autumnal colours and I think this is, makes it very, very warm and cosy like you want to come and hang out here. Definitely. OK, what we're going to do here, Melissa, is uh, build an outdoor table. Great. We're going to use pine H3, six for two, easily available, and it's going to stand the test of time. We've cut six of those. This is just 30 more pine decking. We're going to come in 150 from each end, and we're just going to put one in the middle. But these little cleats are basically going to hold this whole tabletop together. We're going to screw the outside ones first. Basically, that's just going to lock the whole thing in. We're going to put them diagonally, so we're going to put one there and one there. It means this timber's not going to cup in the future. OK. So space them wide apart. Good Slow trick. That. Good trick. Yeah, you could do this one. Too. I know, I'm kind of feeling like I might want to have a go with that drill. So you want to give it a crack? That's it. Just put a little bit of weight on it. Nice and straight. Oh, just whoop. Keep going, keep going. Oh. Put a weight on it. Jeepers. Oh. Oops. It was just I wasn't on the right angle. You know how it is sometimes. Exactly. Excuses. Straight as you can, a little bit of weight. Oh, yes. that was a good one. <laughs> anyway, wait on it. Two more. If I can do this, anyone can do this, believe me. Voila, look at that. That's done. You could definitely dance on that, it's not gonna collapse. I'd like to see that a bit later, eh? <laughs> so that's the tabletop done. And now for the legs. So look what I've done here, I've marked it out. The width of the table and the height of the table. Then we're just going to mark underneath there with our pencil, just like that. Perfect angles. Perfect angles, that's what we're after. Now for one of Dion's famous tricks that you can use to construct the legs, especially if you're up for using a skill saw. Wait for it. How are you going to get all that wood out? Check this out. Ah, tricks of the trick. So we're just going to a sharp little trusty old chisel. Get the rest of them, yeah? Mm. I see, I see. And the same on the other one. I'm going to give the honours to you. OK. Ah! <laughs> Some frustration's gone out of my day here. <laughs> we'll just clean that up, eh? That little sharp chisel. That is a really good trick. I like that. Look at that. Voila. And now for the finishing touches. I've added some framing, but it looks good without it. I've made a bench seat too. It's exactly the same design method as a table, except a little bit smaller. Go to our website for the plans. It has everything you need to know. So this is Cabot's deck and exterior stain in charcoal from Guthrie Baron. It's the same as we've used on the trellis and the seat. It's a highly durable stain and it's designed to rejuvenate and transform the colour of exterior timber. Apply along the timber, including the edges, and wipe off any excess stain with a cloth to ensure an even finish. Allow the first coat to dry, then apply a second coat using the same method. Continue until you've got the depth of colour you want. I'm loving that the bench matches the base of the table with its cross-leg style design. Hey, I can't wait to just stand back and just have a look at this, Melissa. Look at that. This is awesome. It certainly doesn't look like it was done on a tight budget, does it? Exactly. It is so inexpensive and so easy to do. It. And now for some finishing touches to make this outdoor room even more inviting and cosy. I'm also going to add these pine cones, more as a decorative thing, just for fun, because it creates more of that atmosphere of autumn, wintry, warm, cosy feel. Just stand back and just soak that up, eh? Yeah, we have created a stylish, cosy space to enjoy in those colder months, and we've done it on a really good budget. I love the table. It's so stable and stylish, and I love the charcoal stain. Hey, I love it too. Hey, I love how you've decorated. It looks awesome. Coming up, Monty's here with some important info about the dreaded flu. You won't want to miss this. So flu season is on its way. Now, I've only ever had the real flu twice in my life, and boy, you know when you've got it, don't oh, you? Oh, you sure do. I've had it once, Minnie. And when I met with Dr John, he spoke about 60 million people getting wiped out, young, fit, healthy people, as a result of the flu epidemic. So it is something that we've got to be prepared for. That's right. It was 1918. We don't want a repeat of that. I can't even bear a cold, so I'm all ears. Brace yourselves, people. The flu season is here. It's nasty, dangerous, and a little bit misunderstood. Luckily, Dr. John Cameron is with me to give us some tips on protecting ourselves and our families this winter. And to help us bust some common myths about the flu virus and vaccine.
Is it more than a touch of man flu? Oh, influenza is a very specific disease. You don't have a touch of the flu. You've got a touch of the flu, you've got a cold, you've got a runny nose, you've got some snot. Influenza, high fever, joint aches, muscle aches, run over by a truck, sick as a dog, in bed, calling for mother, two weeks later you'll be right. I love this one. No, it is a physical impossibility. The vaccine contains no, zip, zero infectious agents. It is small bits of protein from the virus coat, which we inject into you. Your immune system can then gear up, and sometimes that might make you feel a little, in inverted commas, fluey. Okay, you get some sort of muscle aches and things. It's actually your immune system fighting off the vaccine and building itself up. So no, absolutely not. The vaccine is safe and cannot give you influenza. John, I'm reasonably young, I'm healthy, definitely fit. I mean, I haven't had influenza. I don't need to get immunised. You're exactly the bloke we want to immunise. Uh, if you've never had influenza, it means that your immune system to influenza has never been recharged. And so your immune system will gradually wane, and we need this constant challenge of our immune system, either through vaccination or through catching the influenza virus itself, to build up our immune system. Oh, no, look, influenza virus seems to be really nasty for, for women during pregnancy. Uh, so we want to immunise women, no matter what trimester they are in, uh, against influenza virus. Uh, there have been cases where women have actually died from influenza virus while being pregnant. And that is really scary because you've got the risk of two lives in there. Fit, healthy, young females again being devastated by a viral disease that we can actually prevent. What about all these fancy remedies you can buy at the chemist? Most of those do not actually treat influenza itself. They to look after your symptoms, like to dry up your nose, to take away some of the pain. Uh, you're probably better off just targeting what's going on. If you've got a really drippy, runny nose, use a nasal decongestant spray. Headache, simple pain relief such as paracetamol, ibuprofen, fine. We can't cure you of the influenza virus. You're going to have to ride the ride. So all the wives out there are asking, is there a cure for man flu? They want them off the couch. Nah, sorry, you're just going to have to go with it, girls. Man flu is a terrible disease. We will know what it's like, Monty. I believe you, yeah, Doc. Exactly, mate. So is there anything we can do in the home to minimise the chance of spreading the flu? Oh, Doc, this is a bit of overkill, isn't it? Yeah, well, maybe it does appeal to your inner germ phobia. But in actual fact, there are some very simple things that you can do inside your house to stop the spread of influenza and protect the people who live there. First and most important is hand hygiene. It may sound a bit obvious, but there is a technique. Firstly, you moisten your hands and then apply a soap. And then it's 30 seconds. It's a while. 30 seconds is actually a long time when you're washing your hands. Front, back, between the fingers, just keep massaging it in. Then rinse off thoroughly under hot running water and then dry, either air dry or paper towel dry. What you need to do is to have that length of cleaning to ensure that the virus is removed from your skin. Another thing, we need to keep our distance. A thing called social distancing, which is putting a line of distance between you and anyone who's infected. Therefore, you can protect yourself. You know, when you cough, sneeze, yeah. that stuff's gonna come out, you wanna stay back away from it. We say 1.5 metres distance. Don't take this personally, but just to make sure. sure. Let's see what it looks like. I wanna see how long 1.5 actually is. Here we go there. Yeah. That is a very long way. Yeah, but that's the distance. You know, if you cough or sneeze, it's going to go out at 100 mile an hour. You've got to stay away from me. Now I've got a beautiful wife at home in bed, and when she's sick, this. You've got a text machine? Text, mate. <laughs> <laughs> what about the sneeze? Hard to contain, it just goes everywhere. Yeah, look, there's a technique that we can use. Yeah. We've got our own receptacle. It's built in, bro. You just. <coughs> into the crook of your elbow. Yeah. Not only did it muffle the sound, it stopped any of the spray coming out. Exactly. Then you have to clean off your arm. <laughs> Importantly, and one of the most difficult things, is to be able to remove yourself from the potential of, of passing your virus on to other people. And that means staying away from work. It means kids staying away from school until they are better. It will take, for an adult, seven to ten days before you stop being able to infect other people. So that's the length of time you've got to remove yourself from society. So it doesn't pay to be the tough guy? Absolutely not. All girl, remember. Have you? Oh, good tips. Thanks for that, Monty. And so sad that man flu can't be immunised <laughs> against. Well, Mitty, on behalf of all the men out there, I do thank you for your genuine concern about the worst possible strain you can have when it comes to a virus. I'm sure it is. All the women of the world are rolling their eyes right now. It's been lovely to share another Friday night with you. Thanks for hanging out with us. Look forward to seeing you again next Friday night. Have a wonderful weekend. Paul Marie. Next week on Kiwi Living, fashion queen Kylie Bax is back, and this time she has a married couple to style. Tony's here with some fantastic advice for growing all sorts of citrus. Monty has a bunch of great tips for getting motivated to move. 
Mike has the yummiest brunch menu for feeding friends and whānau. And I visit an outstanding eco home that's full of wonderful surprises. That's next week here on Kiwi Living.